So today we're going to pull back a bit. I think we've done a lot of sessions. Might do a little bit of stats at the end, but I just wanted to do a bit of a general session today, more about the state of meta-analysis and stuff like that. It's just a bit to understand uh, where you would be if you uh, start meta-analysis. Uh, and let's see here. Uh, Anshika, Harjit, Derek, Clement, Zena, Emma, Odette, Najib, uh, Christelle. Okay. Uh, Anshika, Harjit, Derek, Clement, anything unclear from last time that you want to ask? Uh, it was all clear, thank you. Okay. Uh, Zena, Emma, Najib, Christelle, Rami, any uh, questions? Okay, let's ask something. Uh, so anybody heard of network meta-analysis? No? It's all gone quiet. <laughs> all right, so um, I think a few people, more people will join, but uh, I just wanted to go through a bit about um, what is going on with the field of meta-analysis. Yeah. So there has been an exponential growth in, um, I'm using cardiology as a field because cardiology is uh, all the, the biggest volume publishers in the world are all in the field of cardiology, which is very interesting. Um, and uh, they, uh, so the, the people who publish the biggest volume in the world, for some reason within cardiology, this is a, a, a field where people publish. For example, Professor Gregory Lip, who I know, he publishes, um, 300 plus papers a year. Yeah, I don't know, he does it, but anyway, he published 300 and he's on various guideline committees and stuff like that. The guy's a machine. And there are on the top 100 most cited people in, in the world, researchers in the world, there are at least three cardiologists from the UK. So, uh, you know, and these are the most cited researchers in the world. There's a list of the 100 most cited researchers. Anyway, so this is a good, a good example for you to look at. So, for example, in cardiology, there were 2,400 uh, meta-analysis published in 2019, quadruple the number from 2012. This was, I took this from a paper that which I've done a search. And um, there's a, a huge amount of growth in citations and et cetera, and mentions as well. So in 2000, only 1,167 uh, of 663,892 publication mentioned meta-analysis. By 2022, 26,000 or 2.1% of all publications mentioned uh, meta-analysis. And this is very interesting. So it's, I actually came out from medical school in 2001. At that time, this field was a little bit unknown, although I had heard of it, interesting enough, even in medical school. Um, but uh, th th this is increased, yeah? It's increased significantly. Nearly 80 systematic reviews are published every single day. It's important to understand that, you know, quite large numbers. This is a large increase because in 2019, about, uh, you know, uh, eight, eight are being published, but in 2000, 2010, four, and then 14. So not a, uh, a lot more. And that was systematic reviews has come uh, from China, a lot more. Now, the problem with this is that although a lot of people in China are doing systematic reviews, because what they found is they thought, oh, this is an easy way to publication and they invest a lot of money in it. There's only a few centers coming out with quality stuff. I think their big barrier, the barrier that is stopping them is um, not actually the methodology, which is usually pretty strong, is the fact that they're badly written, the English isn't great, the papers are too long. They're not in the right style for uh, the bigger journals. Um, over time, they've become more diverse, journals, types of reviews, systematic and meta-analysis stuff has all sort of split into all these different um, fields and um, types of reviews, yeah? And then out of the 1,132 systematic reviews published in 710 journals, uh, you know, the uh, indexed numbers have increased massively, you know, 29,000 have indexed like in PubMed. Um, the quality is improved, the transparent reporting P items, which is Prisma. Prisma is the, the standards for meta-analysis um, has, has improved significantly. Now, the interesting thing is the world's, one of the world's biggest centers for meta-analysis has always been in the UK. 
In 2000, 2000, 32, 32% came from the UK, 0% from China. And this is because a lot of the people who developed the ideas behind meta-analysis are based on the UK for some Julian Higgins. He's the guy who invented network meta-analysis. He's based out of the UK. Then China has suddenly caught up. 24% are coming from China and 10% from the UK. They... Um, Meta, in China, they don't do systematic reviews. A systematic review is more like you do a search and you do look at the type of papers. They always do a meta-analysis. And this is obviously because they've been told that you have to do the stats, which is very interesting. So that's that they, they will do well, hopefully, in the long run because of this, because they're doing the stats, but not just a systematic review or a narrative review. Um, but even Cochrane reviews were, you know, uh, they didn't do language restrictions, which means they didn't do search in specific English language, et cetera. But they didn't report a number of records of full text screen. They did not name their article as systematic. So in essence, what we're saying is even Cochrane reviews are not of the best quality. Now, what are the publication trends? 30 countries are generating 94.6% of all publications. Yeah, 98.1% of all core clinical journals come from um, you know, the bigger countries. Now, this is a little bit naughty because what is happening is that, you know, to get a journal into PubMed is ridiculously difficult. It's just all a, a, a money game. So if you're a person, even in South Korea, for example, South Korea is a big, rich, is a rich country. But if you look at South Korea, it's like barely any journals on PubMed in cardiology, for example. And why is that? Because to get on PubMed requires you to have a uh, board which is from multi countries you have to have submissions from different countries that you have to accept you have to be on there published five years straight and stuff like that and a lot of that is the only people who have the capacity to do that are people like Elsevier and so they're just making money hand over fist uh, so you've got either Elsevier or um, you know these bigger publishing companies and then you've got these um, scavenger open access <laughs> on the other hand like in Dhabi so they're and now we a very few of the agents already, but the vast majority are just out there to make a quick buck. Like, um, you know, why do you need to 1800 pounds publish an open access journal? I mean, the people have their cost and it's like a hundred pounds, 50 pounds to publish a journal. They don't even print it. So they just put it on a website. So to put it on a the website, they charge you 1800 pounds. Some of it is mean, ridiculous in the UK, open heart, even my university is refusing to pay, it's 2400 pounds for one journal. Now, China publishes more meta-analysis than the USA. And collaborative publishing is also increased. So the top publishing countries, USA, 4.19 million articles. That's unbelievable. <coughs> Number two is only up to 2015. This has changed a bit. Up, though. China was 0 0.91. UK, 0 0.9. Germany, 0 0.7. Japan is pretty good, 0 0.86 million, considering that Japan doesn't have that many people. But it's not bad. Italy is big, actually. Italy, we they don't think of Italians as big researchers, but they are. French has 0 0.5 million. Canada is also considering it's a small country, 0 0.5 million. Australia is a very small country, 0 0.35 million. So they publish a lot. And Spain, 0 0.32. So these, these, these are actually the big countries. Now, within cardiology, interestingly, I can tell you the latest figures. And the growth areas are, interesting enough, in um, the Asia Pacific um, and in Netherlands. And in the UK, these places have published a lot in the last few years. Now, I have been talking for a few minutes. Now I'm going to throw this open to the floor and see what people think about this. Ashika, Harjit, Zaina, Emma, what do you guys think of this? These changes that are occurring. No? No ideas about this? Okay, Odette, Christelle, Rami, Clement, any ideas about this? Yeah, I think I've seen this before, but I would love to see South Saharan, uh, South Saharan Africa's contribution. Oh, I start in Africa's contribution. Uh, oh, man, Clement is so low, so low. Part of it is the barriers, barriers to research, as you know, that even if, let's say, you were a hardworking researcher, there's no interest, that there's no access to journals, searches, computers, um, journals will not publish unless you write in a specific style, etc. The topics that you, for example, would be interested in, uh, like you know, rheumatic heart disease, etc., you know, are not widely as widely covered. 
Okay. So uh, we hand Justice, Valerie, Najib, Kiara. Any feedback on this so far? Okay. Last ask. Uh, Anissa, anything you have to say about this? No? Monica, Sumuchku, Solongo, Hamza, Maddie, any feedback? Do you have anything to say about this? Any ideas? God, the silence is deafening today. <laughs> oh. um, I suppose it's interesting that um, there might be some kind of bias in the data considering the majority of this um, information is coming from white and rich countries predominantly. Yes, yes. This actually does affect meta-analysis in a big way. It's called the um, uh, the uh, cabinet uh, effect or the drawer, the drawer effect. So in essence, what happens is that the bigger studies always get published, uh, the, no matter even if they're positive or negative. Medium studies um, tend to, well, more likely to get published, but sometimes don't get published. The smaller studies only get published in which if they're positive. So this is why we do like a funnel plot. And then the funnel plot, we see if more stuff is on the right side. Now, meta-analysis publication, oh my God, so they've made a, you can see that they've made a concentric effort here. They were not publishing. In 2009, they realized, oh, you don't need to spend a ton of money to publish meta-analysis. So they've zoomed up, oh my God, they're 15,000. But the problem is, even despite this, these are, I think, mostly getting published in their own journals or low-level journals. And in the high-end journals, you still do not see like, for example, if I look at Jack and stuff like that, there's a few Chinese papers, but not that many. They are from they are from like their biggest, most posh centers. And then you see the vast majority of these big meta-analysis, you only see a few names, like this guy called Safi Khan and some other people who are actually doing the majority of these meta-analysis. There's one guy who's sitting in Pakistan, uh, Clement, this is interesting. This guy sits, is sitting in Pakistan out of my old university, yeah, which is, if you go there, is 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 barely has a computer, yeah, <laughs> the whole place. And um, uh, so it's, it's, it's not great. It's, it's, um, th this is the, the, a hospital which is so poor, I remember that there were cats coming out of the operation, the operating paper. So in essence, and he is publishing these big papers in big journals, uh, you know, meta-analysis. It's very, very interesting stuff. Like he once did a, he did a recent analysis where he was looking at what he call, we call combined outcomes. So basically what you do is they say MACE, which is death, heart attack, everything together. But MACE is a trick. Combined outcomes are a trick. They actually make the data very difficult to analyze. And he looked at all these different cardiology trials and then these combined outcomes that don't work. Yeah, so it's amazing. And he's got all these collaborators um, in the UK and from America and all that. So uh, it's possible. But the problem is that this does not reflect the reality of it, that the Chinese also are doing lots. They're not actually publishing it necessarily in the biggest channel. Now, this is very interesting that they all, one of the reasons that I don't think they've had a great amount of success is that although they're collaborating more, they're still not collaborating enormous amounts. Who is collaborating the most? UK and Germany. Yeah, and that's why UK is still at the top and Germany is doing well as well. Oh, well no, not as well as the UK, but still doing well. Um, now, this is another problem, something called overlapping meta-analysis. Now, overlapping meta-analysis, this is quite a critical article, so or take a pinch, a pinch of salt. But in essence, what he's done is they've taken some specific topics. And they said, well, 73 meta-analysis published in 2010 that they searched out, 67% had one other overlapping meta-analysis. And the median was, or the most common number was two meta-analysis per topic. And 17 topics, at least one author was involved in two of the overlapping meta-analysis. Um, and then uh, of 20 randomly selected topics, 13 of the, the most recent material did not include any additional articles. But to be honest, the reality is that this is actually stupid because the, we do need new meta-analysis. Obviously, if new papers come out, they have to be added in and new meta-analysis has to be published. Yeah. And now we've got new statistical techniques such as meta-regression, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the point a, overall is that... Uh, is better to do, uh, um, if you can, a new meta-analysis. Yeah, a new meta-analysis in the fresh topic. And this is why when I taught you guys how to search, I said search for new original work as far as possible. 
Um, and so, but this is this is interesting from Jack Network, and they were saying, uh, you know, uh, how you can get published in a, in a meta analysis. And one of the things they said is that um, you try and use uh, quality, good quality control for Cochrane Handbook or Prisma guidelines. Prisma guidelines are actually the most important. So they've said, uh, you know, uh, there are more, many more meta analysis being published. Um, in 2021, because of JAMA. Now, JAMA is Journal of American Medical Association, and this is one of the biggest journals in the world. Yeah. So you have to remember that when they say they only pub accept a few, they have to remember they, they don't accept any sort of paper. The vast majority of papers that are sent to them are rejected. So they sent 655 meta analysis, one set of systematic reviews. Now, they accepted 9% of of the meta-analysis and 17% of the systematic reviews. And they said, well, what do we look for? Why is a new network meta-analysis or network meta-analysis needed? Um, does it address a, an error in a previous meta-analysis? Makes this correct focus or report? This actually often enough occurs. Uh, we did one recently, for example, which was Impella versus uh, balloon pump. Now, I've been considering this topic for a number of years by waiting, waiting, waiting. And then this gigantic study came out and then I realized, oh my God, now it's statistics significant. So we've done it now. So that would be an interesting one. And uh, how many meta-analysis on to this topic and how do you compare with the previous meta-analysis and network methods? For me, um, uh, if there are two new papers and especially the results change, then it's worth it. It shouldn't discourage you. My viewpoint is it shouldn't discourage you. But the point they're making is that if you aim for the highest level, that in a sense that is a topic where there are lots of new papers, the new papers change the result, or if nobody's done a meta-analysis, that's a little bit better. So if they've said a first meta-analysis on a topic, even if results shows very little literature can be of some value and point to areas of future research. And they said they published a systematic review that examined the literature on communication between anesthesiologists and patients beyond simply the process for informed consent with anesthetic. The main finding was literature was scanned. And then they did a network meta-analysis on types of non-invasive ventilation in uh, acute hypoxemic liver, uh, uh, respiratory failure. First analysis of the question and time because of COVID related. Um, and they said one of the problems external reviews often um, identify relevant studies that were missed or excluded for no unclear reason. So, but specifically goes into the review process, they find, oh, you haven't got all the studies. Now, I'm going to stop here for a second again. And then um, let's see if you guys have anything interesting to say. Um, and Sheikha, Harjit, Zaina, Emma, anything to say so far? No? Odette, Crystal, Rami, Clement, Bihan, anything to say so far? No, no, no. no. Okay. Bihan, you know a bit of stats. Anything, anything to say? Um, no, not really, no. <laughs> okay. All right. Justice, Valerie, Kiara, Madi, Hamza, anything to say? Nothing, thank you. All right, so long goes so much to Anisa. Kit. Oh, Kit, you're joining. Oh, Kit, with you're the joining. What do you think so far? Uh, Rita, Monica, Ryan, anything to say? Okay, fine. All right. Um, so. Now, this is the reason I want to bring this up is I want to talk about how you could do your meta analysis in such a way that will uh, get published. And one of the new things that's come out is something called network meta analysis. Now, network meta analysis, we'll go into it in a minute, but in essence, a lot of, for a lot of treatments, three, for a lot of um, topics, three treatments might exist. So in cardiology, there might be aspirin, clopidogrel, prasugrel. Together, yeah, but you can't compare them directly. So they may not be a head to head trial, what's say, with aspirin or uh, versus clopidogrel, or they might be only a head to so, or, or so they may not be a head to head trial with which, which compare all four. So, what do you do then? Oh my god, what is this? Oh, this is a network. In this network, let's say these all these drugs are being compared. 
timolol, brinzolamide, dorzolamide. So what did you do is that somebody might have compared brinz uh, 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 brimonidine to placebo. Yeah, there might be a trial. There might be another trial which is compared beta betoxol to bromidine. What you do is you bring all this trial data in, and then what you do is you can compare drugs that have never been compared in the trial because what you're making an assumption. That assumption is that that the, the if if there is a difference that exists between this and this, that allows us to calculate the difference between this and this. Another way of thinking of this is, um, I am going to go to uh, Paris, and then I'm going to go to Berlin. And the, 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 time, the time it took me to Paris, and then the time it took me to Berlin, I can add those together and come up with a journey time from London to Berlin. Yeah. So in essence, you're making an assumption. It's interesting. But the problem, this makes the data super accurate, yeah? is very, very accurate because you are using all these direct, indirect outcomes. You're putting all this data into the network is very accurate, yeah? This is called a node, this is called an edge. The connection is called an edge. So you can compare the effectiveness data between competing treatments, yeah? And NMA, uh, the limitations subject to individual RCTs within the network. You can, what you can do is, um, you don't need to know the Sukra stuff, but you basically, you can rank the treatments. You can say, this treatment is better, this treatment is worse, yeah? And you do that by saying, by comparing them all to the placebo. So the placebo is the baseline, and you compare every single treatment to the placebo. So placebo becomes zero. And then you say, um, you know, the uh, effect of brenolamide is about one, timolol is three, whatever. So you're comparing them all to the placebo, yeah? You rank them. And uh, incoherence is the bugbear, absolute bugbear of network meta-analysis. That the underlying assumption that I'm going to go from London to Paris and then to Paris to Berlin, and then I can add the London and Paris together um, and then make or, or calculate. So basically I can calculate the distance time or the time it will take to get to Berlin from these two separate calculations. That assumption we have to assume. And if it's not, so what I do is if I somehow manage to find a direct route from London to Berlin, and then I, I realized that the, the calculation I've made by adding the two other journeys together was not consistent. So this is called incoherence, they're not consistent. So, but that is not very common. Only 14% of studies showed this incoherence. And transitivity means that is exchangeability. Basically, one trial can be exchanged with another trial. But let's go into some recent studies. Yeah, I did a simple search. Yeah, and this is why I wanted to go over this with you because you guys are going to be the next generation of people who do meta analysis. So you need to be future proofed. Yeah, you guys need to be ready. So I just did a search and I said, bring up all the network meta analysis published from 2019. Just a simple Google search. Yeah, simple. Look at the number of citations, 84, 103. Well, this 25, this one's low. This is that guy I was mentioning, Safi Khan, 110. This guy's got 210 citations. Okay, what papers are these? Yeah, the enormous number of citations, yeah? This is one of them. What is this? Oh, this is different types of stents, stenty techniques, crush, couloir, tiga crush, whatever. He took 21 randomized control trials, five bifurcation techniques, got this published in Jack Intervention, which is like an enormous journal, yeah, enormous, incredible. it's like as big, if you a PhD, you do a PhD, you do publish one paper here, yeah, and you can see that uh, he's got just a few trials. This, how much more work this is than the normal meta-analysis, and yeah, he got published. So I'm just saying, if you, if you take that, um, so the, the thing is that a lot of people are doing meta-analysis and a lot of people are, might be doing meta-analysis on the topic that you want to do. So you have to future-proof. And for future-proofing, you might have to do network meta-analysis. There's another one, another of the studies. This, I'm, I'm just going through them in order so you understand. Like I'm not biasing the search in any way. Well, maybe a little bit. And this is like a heart failure. He compared all the different heart failure combination treatments. That's amazing, so useful, yeah? So, we use all these heart failure drugs, but what if you combined all of these different ones? Uh, yeah, 
And it turned out the one that we like is the best one, which is the, you know, ACE inhibitor beta blocker, spironolactone, and dapagliflozacin. This is the best. Very closely with the one without the dapagliflozacin. So that's very close, <laughs> but it's fine. So my point is, this was more difficult. Seventy-five papers, so much, much more difficult. And this is not something I would easily do unless I had a large team or whatever. But this is still pretty good. Seventy-five. Yeah. But this one got a ridiculous number of citations. Let me show you. Uh, this one got 103 citations got in Jack Hartfield. This one is not as big, but um, and this one didn't get that many citations. He only got 25 citations. But he did a simple one. And he looked at randomized control trials, and then um, he found, I think it was 26, 26 randomized control trials. You know, you can see he, he got published as well. Uh, but this is a proper one. Uh, uh, Greg Stone. Greg Stone is an enormous publisher. Yeah, he publishes piles and piles. I think these are all people from my country. The name sounds suspiciously like that from Pakistan. But anyway, this guy lives in America. So he, uh, he does good work. Uh, anyway, so basically, he looked 24 randomized controlled trials and he looked at the different types of therapies optimal six months, 12 months, extended, etc. This was pretty good. He has got. 110 citations already. So let's go back to the um, everybody here. I'm gonna pick on people. Uh, oh, Maddie, you're at the top. I'm gonna pick on you first. Maddie, what did you think so far? And Chika, Harjit, Zena, any thoughts so far? Emma, any thoughts? Odette, Christelle, I might ask the panelists. Alexandrina, what did you think so far? Um, yeah, no, I think this is a very interesting perspective. Um, I was wondering, is this kind of a new technique that people are using for meta-analysis or has it been around for quite a while? Uh, it's been around for the last 15 years. But not that many. Um, Valerie, Justice, Wehan, what do you think? Rami, anything? No? Christelle, Odette, Emma, Monica, Rita, Rishbash. My oh, God, the silence is deafening. No one has to say anything. To stand into silence. Kit, what did you think so far? Um, it's really interesting so far. Uh, so thank you for, for kind of sending me the link to join. No, it's not at all. OK, fine. So what is a network? So we're just going to go into this a little bit. No, a huge amount, because this is not, um, there are still topics in main meta I want to do. But I thought it would be interesting to just um, future proof you guys and make you understand what is actually happening in the field of meta-analysis so we want you to take a step back. So A, treatment A versus B. Yeah. Uh, and this is, there are two nodes and this is compared by edge. And the edge is how A and B correlate. So this, uh, another way of, as, as I told you before, is uh, imagine London, Paris. London, Paris, Berlin. Yeah. London, Paris, Berlin. But then I say, well, London to Berlin. So A is B minus simple. Ta -da. So this is, is actually interesting enough. Although we're making an assumption here. Uh, we're making an assumption. You know, it does work. It allows to us to pool all the different information within studies. Um, it can compare all the different treatments. It, it takes indirect evidence plus direct evidence. And if the assumptions are met, which means that, you know, uh, with the assumption of making the direct versus indirect is similar, then, uh, which is coherence, then it's fine. And the other interesting thing to note is that the more treatments you have, the more connections there are. 
and the number of comparisons skyrockets. You can make an enormous number of comparisons with this. This uses something called a frequentist approach, which means that basically you can't, uh, in, in short, you can't do it with a pencil and paper, yeah? You can't. A frequentist approach means that you basically create all these different models, and then it basically uh, uses the most useful one, yeah? In R, actually, this is not much more difficult than normal meta-analysis because you're not doing anything, isn't it? You're asking the program to do the um, thingy for you. So frequentist approach is the probability if we repeat the experiment many, many times. And frequentist ideas are you know, behind p-values and confidence. Because what is a p-value? P-value means less than 0 0.05 means there's a 1 in 20 chance that this event might happen. Yeah, so this is a frequentist. Now, this is where we get into the difficult data bit. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to ask you to for today. I'm not going to ask you to do um, this uh, database just just yet. Okay, or, or or we can do this a little bit. But I'm just going to go back a little bit and just go over what we said today very very quickly. The meta analysis is increasing, is, is, you know, is quadrupling, tripling, you know, uh, is being mentioned more and more. And the other interesting thing is low meta analysis are getting citations. Yeah? Um, they are a lot more coming from China. They love from food. And I think this is a great technique that if you are not, especially if you're in Africa or in um, a developing country like where well, you come from, this is a great technique uh, way to get published because you're not going to get money for a huge trial there easily. Uh, but they're still not publishing. Most of the publications are still coming from 30 countries. And we know which these countries are. Yeah, these are the top 10 countries. The other countries are all basically in Europe and, um, you know, Korea and stuff like that. Korea is still publishing as much as I thought they would. And as you can see, although trends are changing, the USA is not, we used to be 50% of all publication based on that. Um, and there's still a ridiculous number of systematic review publications coming from the US. And collaboration is the way that we found the UK, Germany. In essence, what we're doing is we're working Europe-wide. So we're trying to ramp up with the big boys. Yeah? We're trying to ramp up in here in the UK. And we talked about overlapping meta-analysis. And this is something that is, is a slight problem. I don't think it's a huge problem, but can become a problem with publication. That uh, And they said that a new topic would always be helpful. They think a new topic would be helpful. It has to be of a high quality. This is why the Chinese aren't getting published as much because they, 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 the way they write it is not as, as uh, careful. And that's, uh, I'm not sure the reasons that some of it is obviously uh, English and uh, other is that they need to really carefully look at. They don't invest enough time into the looking at how the journals publish. There's also some discrimination from journals. If you send an article, let's say I send an article to the American journal, they'll straight away try to look at where the article came from. And if it's an American who wrote it, they're gonna take it. And if it's, uh, uh, if I wrote it, then it's very, very difficult to publish. Well, well, I worked with this professor, he's very, very intelligent. And he's pu published 30 papers here. He said he's only got one paper into the American journal in his entire career. Anyway, I got him another one last year, and then Jack says, so new topic, yeah. And then network we talked about, we can compare lots and lots of different bits of data and you can rank them, yeah. Of all these papers and you can see, it's interesting enough, just if you just look at the number of papers in each, what I'm trying to say is not that much more difficult. So this was about uh, how many trials were there here? Uh, I think there was like 17 or something, I forget now. This one had 75. This one, again, didn't have that many, 26. I mean, the normal meta-analysis should be fine. This one had 24. So what I'm trying to say is not huge. Yeah? And then we talked about direct versus indirect evidence, and then how exponential increases. Now, frequentist. This is, uh, now you can all do this in the chapter, but it's quite easy. Yeah? So um, for those who don't know, so Kit, basically, what you have to do is there's a book called Meta-Analysis with R. <laughs> And you can go into that book and then you can install the programs in chapter two and all the data sets are in there. But let's say you decide to do this. So this is the therapy formats data set. 
And then what you do is that you uh, want to run the, uh, this, um, one second, I think I need to show you the, let me stop sharing and let me go to my thingy. Uh, share screen. Okay. And I'll just quickly show you guys in my the cookie thing and then you'll understand a bit. So, um, first of all, library demetar data therapy format. So you pull up the data and then you can have a look at this data. And this basically, if you go back to the PowerPoint, uh, this basically has a treatment effect and then the standard error. Now you, are, you obviously understand this, isn't it? Every treatment has an effect and it has a standard error. Uh, and then what you can do is that you can look at um, how many arms are in each trial, yeah? This one has a multi-arm trial. There's only one multi-arm trial. Every other trial is head-to-head -head comparison. Okay, it's very important to understand that each individual study, despite all the comparisons, has a unique uh, name. And if, uh, yeah, has a unique name, yeah? So we've got our data here, and then we run NetMeta, which is, you know, it's got all your data here. And well, the important thing to understand, okay, and the others is that you have to run this code exactly as it is here. So you don't need to worry too much about this. For those who know, this is treatment effect, standard error, yeah, which it happens in every, um, you know, paper will give you treatment effect, standard error. Um, this treatment one, treatment two, study label. The data is in this file, therapy formats, and this is standardized mean deviation, yeah. And then we'd use, in this case, fixed effects model. And this is a reference group. You have to have a reference group where everything has to be compared to. Yeah? Voila. And then we've done our network meta-analysis already. Yeah, it's, it's given uh, the data, which is treatment arms. So the, most of them have two. The results. Now, this is very, very interesting. Now, let me just show you on this because this displays better here. So only one study had three arms. And then what you can see is the most, most important thing, which is the treatment estimate. The treatment estimate tells you how good the treatment is compared to CAU, CAU. And you can see this is a standard mean deviation for each treatment. Each treatment, GRP, GSH, IND, TEL, USH, has is compare is, is being compared. Each of them is being given a number, and this is very interesting. So they're all being compared to the placebo. Yeah. So this is the baseline. Because you have to establish a baseline. Yeah. So this is uh, your uh, result. And that we can turn into a forest plot, which I show you down here. Ta-da! So forest plot. And what it does is the forest plot which can do forest.net meta, allows you to, in, this is the different therapies, individual, group, telephone, guided, self-guided, unguided, self-help. So basically what it does, each of them is being compared. So from statistically, and from a point of view of uh, the, um, what's it called, um, uh, R, it's actually simple. It's, it's not that much more complicated. It gives you this number, yeah? And um, the standardized mean deviations, and you can put that in a forest plot. How is that different? It's not that different, really. Yeah. And it gives you a test of heterogeneity. Now, the important thing is the Q column, which is the inconsistency. And you can see most of the inconsistency is coming from Crable. Crable is causing trouble in our network. Yeah. It's the troublemaker. So, what it does is gives you an overall Q, and the overall Q is basically inconsistency in the network, which is the basically the underlying assumption is being challenged by this. Yeah, so that's probably the most critical bit. The heterogeneity is very, very high in this network. I squared, as we discussed before, more than 50% is bad. In this case, it's about 89.6%, which is enormous. And then the heterogeneity, which is the variation between the papers, is two types. Uh, within design heterogeneity, a design is 
uh, conditions within the trial. A is B, B uh, or A, B, C, in the sense that a trial. Um, and then between design heterogeneity is um, the overall network. What I'm trying to say is that uh, if you are have three trials and they all compare aspirin and clopidogrel, aspirin, clopidogrel, aspirin, clopidogrel, so then in that case, the within design heterogeneity is the difference between those trials. Whereas uh, inconsistency between designs, which is here, is um, the fact that the, the, the network, the, the, the assumptions, underlying assumptions of this are being challenged. Yeah. And then we can create this. It's quite easy to do as well. Ta da! And you basically create this, which we talked about. So, in essence, there were three things. Just to make you understand again. First of all, you can run network net meta as long as you have the data and you can create this um, uh, network meta analysis. Yeah, and which is giving you all your different numbers, which is your standard mean deviation, is giving you a lot of heterogeneity, 89.6%, uh, is giving you this uh, Q, which basically Crable is causing inconsistent network. And then we say within design or between design heterogeneity. And uh, within design, which means a lot of most of the heterogeneity is coming from within the comparisons, the trials themselves, even though they, they might have the same comparison, differ from each other. And then you can create this uh, network, yeah, and label it. Um, and uh, so you can create this network and you can label it, yeah. And then when you if you want, you can split the direct or indirect evidence here, okay, if you want. But I'm going to stop here and then and then think I'll give you a breather. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a bit um, uh, hardcore this topic. Harjit, Zena, Emma, Odette, Christelle, any questions? No. No. No questions. Rami, Vihan. What do you think we have? Have you heard of this before? We have. Have you heard of this technique before? It's a hard call. Justice, Valerie, Valerie, any, uh, what do you think? Um, I think this is an interesting one, especially because we can compare different interventions um, indirectly. Absolutely. And this is interesting that you, you can compare and that's most nowadays as science is expanding, most uh, diseases will have multiple treatments. And you have to understand there are all sorts of like even exercise is a treatment. Uh, counseling is a treatment. For example, if you have a heart attack, you can have aspirin, or you can have beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, statin, you can have cardiac rehab, um, you know, etc. You can have nurse-led cardiac rehab. You can have doctor-led cardiac rehab. So there's like so many things. You can have a um, online rehab program. You can have a program in by a phone. You can have, you know, it's just guys and sad. There's like ridiculous numbers of different treatments that are available nowadays. And the advantage of this technique is that you can uh, compare all of them. Let's ask some other people. Uh, Clement, what do you think? Well, um, it was after the last presentation I got to know about this um, network analysis. So but I'm finding it very interesting. I'll try it out later. Yeah, yeah because the thing, Clement, for your uh, the, the, the thing, I think this will be helpful. That's one of the reasons I wanted to present today on this. Because I think for uh, the, the TB drugs thing, this might work. Because you've got lots of different drugs, don't you? And yes, no yes, thank you very much. And nobody's done a network meta-analysis on this topic at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can I just ask something? Um, yeah, no, no. Sorry. Can I ask, are there any restrictions or limitations on what sort of studies you can include for these comparisons? Well, you have to have a randomized control trial usually. Okay, so is that literally it? As in, then you could compare absolutely any study to any study? Well, yes and no. It, it depends. So if, let's say, a cancer medication is being used in 
um, uh, uh, they can be different types of patients. So they have to be the same patient. So let's say um, some, some chemotherapy is used in early cancer and some is used in later cancer. They are not comparable because the patient population has to be exactly the same. Okay, that, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. But there are not that many other uh, limitations, yeah? There are not that many other limitations. Let me just show you guys all of this again, yeah? So you guys understand the concepts behind it. So first of all is, okay, let me go my slides. We talked about this. Uh, a versus B versus C. London, Paris, Berlin. Oh my God, I can jump from London to Berlin. I know the distance now, I forgot. So one hour to Paris, two hours to Berlin. It, to be honest, most of the time this will work. Yeah? So this, but this is very powerful because you got so much data now. Now I know I can say learn. Uh, so now I can even calculate things in reverse. So I could say, well, what if I travel back and I, um, you know, traveled from uh, Berlin to Paris to the UK, but let's say I put in another city I put in Amsterdam and I put in Madrid. Suddenly I've got this amazing network that can tell me how much it would try take to travel to all these different countries. Yeah, or these different cities. Do you understand? The network becomes very powerful as you add in data to it, as the number of connections grows. There's a negative aspect to this. The negative aspect of this is that oh, you're gonna kill yourself putting all this data in the network. So uh, you have to use these competitionally powerful approaches, which is called a frequentist approach. There's an alternative one called a Bayesian approach, but I won't do that today. You don't do that. You then do this. You take net meta, yeah, net meta. Let's not go as the stats of this, but uh, you, you can use this uh, internet file therapy formats, and then you can uh, look at this, and then you, and this is just, a, they've just seen how many arms there are, okay? And then these are the, like, as you know, with R, you just select the code. You select the code and then you put it in. And in this case, we discussed TEs, the treatment si effect sizes, SE is the standard error. That's all you need from each paper. And then uh, the name of the first treatment, name of the second treatment, the label of the study, the name of our data set, the summary measure, which can be risk difference, risk ratio, odds ratio, hazard ratio, means difference, standardized mean difference. Yeah. And then random effects or fixed effects model, as we discussed before, random effects, you make the assumption the world is random. Fixed effects means uh, everything is fixed. So random effects for metaphor. Yeah. And reference group this is very important. You need to have a reference group. Everything's going to be compared to this reference group. Yeah. And then you run your thingy. And then now it's amazing. You've got your results and those results show that uh you know the uh well they, they, these are not the final results that i will go to that in a minute but uh in essence this is giving you the standard mean deviation for um each of them each of the papers and then it's giving you how much is affecting the inconsistency which in this case is crab walking and then this is where the results are you can see standardized mean division compared to count. And you now have a rank. And you can say this treatment is the best treatment. This treatment is second best. This treatment is third best. And this is like the most amazing thing. That when you see this, it just makes everything clear. And for clinicians, for guideline makers, this is stupendously powerful. Because they can now see what treatment works. It's amazing. Although the heterogeneity here is high. And, but we can see that most inconsistency doesn't come from the network. Uh, it comes from the fact that they are a bit different from each other. Okay. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about this, but in essence, and then you can create a network graph, which is this. Yeah, you can just say, this is how the whole network works. Now the thicker the line, that means the more the connections there. You can also turn this into dotted lines, which are indirect and direct. And then you can split this and look at it. Oh, well, how much is direct? How much is indirect? You know, in each comparison, yeah? And the direct is more powerful. So for example, this one, GSH with WLC is made up mostly of direct elements. So that's very, very good. That's very, very good. And now what you can do is that you can do a rank, treatment ranking. I love treatment ranking. Treatment ranking is great. I rank them. This is good. Oh, 
high and D is the best. Individual therapy is the best. Yeah, that would make sense. Right? And then you can create a forest block. Forest net matter, simple. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about net heat plots and stuff like that, but net heat plot, basically it looks at all the different comparisons and red is a bad. Red means this inconsistency. So this was a fixed effects and then we changed to random effects that, you know, all the naughtiness disappeared. And, uh, you know, this is just a splitting. So we split all the direct and indirect evidence. You can do that if you want. Yeah. And you can do a funnel plot as per usual, you know, funnel plot. You know. So I think I'll uh, stop there and then go 